Hi everyone, thank you for joining us at this Your Overseas Home webinar, How to Buy Safely in Portugal. It's great to have you all with us, um, whether you're joining us live or you're watching on demand. Um, my name is Roseanne Bradley, I'm a senior writer at Your Overseas Home and Property Guides. Um, at Your Overseas Home, we do believe that there's three contacts that you need to securely and safely buy in Portugal. Um, so today we've invited three guests who each represent one of these contacts. We have Jack Wiggs, um, a senior trader at Smart Currency Exchange. We have John Stewart, Central Algarve Sales Manager at Divine Homes Portugal. And last but not least, Joanna Mestre, a solicitor from Matlaw. Um, this session will be an hour long. If you have any questions throughout, just pop them in the question box. Um, it's just on the bottom right, it's got a question mark. Um, and we'll get to them um, when we can. Um, if you need a reminder of anything discussed today or want to share this event with family and friends afterwards, it will be available on demand on the Eurovisi's Home website, I think, tomorrow. Um, so um, we have three wonderful experts here today. Joanna, would it, um, it would be great if you could please start by giving us a quick summary of who you are and how Matlaw can help our viewers today. Thank you so much, Rosian. Um, I apologize because my camera is not working at all. I've tried so many times, but at least you have a photo and my name and you can hear me, I hope. So Alpha Mat Law um, is a law boutique and we focus on advisory to uh, people willing to invest in Portuguese real estate, not only in the, in the Algarve, but throughout the whole company, uh, the whole country, sorry. Our offices are in Lisbon and also in Central Algarve, Almancil. Uh, we also take care of all connected legal and tax matters, such as immigration and nationality, for those of you who plan or think on a permanent move to Portugal, and the taxation uh, related to your income as uh, Portuguese um, investors and as Portuguese tax residents. So. Uh, we do are the point of contact of many uh, people with a uh, uh, overseas home and also uh, the support for those willing to come and to relocate to Portugal. Lovely, thank you. And uh, next, John. My microphone. There we go. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm John Stewart. Um, I've been working 20 years in real estate in both Portugal and Spain, uh, the last 10 of which have been uh, with Divine Home here in Portugal. Uh, hopefully I offer a wealth of experience for any prospective buyer thinking of moving here or buying a property here. Um, if we talk about Divine Home, we're a company that's been established for a little over 15 years. We have three offices in the Algarve. Uh, we're five star rated on Google Business, uh, so I think we uh, we work very well with our clients uh, from around the world. Um, we have a large multinational team. Uh, predominantly, we work in English as our first language, um, and we work with clients through every stage of buying a property uh, in Portugal. Um, that can very often be uh, from months, weeks, and even years before they they come to the country. So uh, we guide you through every step of the process. Um, we can recommend builders, lawyers, uh, um, insurance companies, uh, everything related to owning a property in Portugal and living in Portugal. The process doesn't stop there uh, with Divine Home. We also offer a really good after sales uh, uh, service uh, with key holding and management services. And for those people that want to rent out their properties, we also own a company uh, that works in the, the touristic industry. So, so essentially we're a one-stop shop uh, to simplify the process of buying a property in Portugal. Fabulous, thanks. And Jack from Smart. Hi, everybody. Thanks for attending today. Um, and thanks, Rosie, for hosting. Um, I'm one of the senior traders at Smart Currency Exchange. So um, I've been working here for about six years now, uh, and Smart Currency uh, are very much focused on property. So we're in the, the property space to help clients um, understand the risk that their budgets are at when buying property abroad. Um, and we're really here to help make, uh, make your life easier in terms of understanding uh, the process of buying euros um, and managing the volatility in the market throughout the, the journey that you're you're going on when buying a property in Portugal. 
Um, as I said, we've been around for about 20 years now. We've helped over 40,000 clients um, buy property. Um, and we've got a, a, a large team here to facilitate with, with all sorts of transfers, um, even beyond property. So things like pension transfers, mortgage payments, living costs and things like that. Um, and that's where, yeah, that's where we specialise. Fab, thanks, Jack. Um, I think we're going to start off with a question towards all of you. Um, so as your overseas home suggests, um, you three and your business represent the three um, businesses, basically, that um, are key contacts for moving to Portugal. At what stage um, would you advise someone to get in touch with your company? Um, John, do you want to go first? As soon as you think uh, that you would like to own a home here, I think uh, um, we, as I said in my sort of introduction, we work with clients uh, from the very, very early stages, um, giving them market information, uh, advising them on different areas. Uh, depends on, on how people are going to uh, uh, come to Portugal, how well they know Portugal. Um, so if you want to live here, schools and things like that for your children, um, how to get into the social security system, visa applications, uh, we, we help people with. I mean, generally we refer that sort of thing off to, to someone like Joanna, but we can give a brief overview of how those things work. So yeah, uh, as soon as possible, you should be contacting us. Lovely. And Jack? Uh, Miles is actually very similar to John's. Um, yeah, as soon as possible. So. Um, one of the common mistakes that we find that people make is engaging in conversation with us right at the very end, so a couple of days before completion. We, we can help them, um, you know, nothing wrong with having a conversation, then, but you, you don't get to really understand the, the service uh, and really take advantage of the service um, from an early stage. So the idea of engaging with us before you've been on a viewing trip and, and when you've got the idea of buying property in Portugal um, is so that we can help you with your understanding your budgets, understanding uh, what factors could come into play that could affect your uh, your euros um, and then start putting a strategy together that's tailored to you individually as one of our clients on how to manage that, that currency um, over the next few months or potentially years uh, of your, your purchase over in Portugal. Oh, thank you. And Joanna? I would say exactly the same. I don't want to repeat myself, but you know, having um, the, each uh, uh, process and each client is unique. And perhaps you'll find many people say, "This is quite straightforward. You just have to do this and this and that." But indeed, it's really in a first one or two or three initial conversations that we can realize what are the client's needs. And sometimes you have needs that you don't know you have. So the role of your um, solicitor in Portugal is to help you structure your life and your project of moving abroad, if that is the case, as best as possible, because that may have implications with your finances, with your um, state planning, with um, your family, your children, uh, your taxation, uh, if you intend to, to move on a permanent basis. So the sooner the better, because um, we can give you also the assurance that you won't be alone in this journey. You know, we, we're here to help and to provide the best uh, assistance possible. Um, and, and on a separate note, and now directly related to the uh, property investment itself, uh, the sooner you have your powers of attorney organized with your solicitor, your Portuguese fiscal number in place, uh, in some cases your bank account open here, the better because John will, will share much more about this, but the market is still crazy and Portugal um, real estate prices have gone up a lot. Um, and what we feel is that properties just fly off the market. So if you lose time with those introduction, introduction uh, introductory steps like uh, meeting your solicitor, organizing your finances, you may actually lose the property you really would like to buy. Um, so I think, in, in, in a nutshell, this is a teamwork. You really need to contact the, you know, all the, the advisors and supporters in an early stage and to do your homework. Oh, thanks, Joanna. I think John's agreeing with you there. 
Yeah, I'd like to add something to it. And seeing as I was I was named, uh, I think it's uh, uh, hopefully okay to do that. I think, you know, being prepared is so important. Uh, most often when we do have people coming over to look at properties, um, that is a limited uh, experience. It might be three or four days, it might be a week, it might, might be a couple of weeks. Uh, uh, but, but what I say to most people is that your time here is valuable. So uh, to maximize that, if you come here with knowing how much your money is worth, uh, you know, with a good quote from your currency uh, uh, provider um, and also, you know, having a lawyer already prepared with power of attorney who can work quickly on your behalf, it does mean that when you do find the property that you want, um, you can talk confidently, confidently, make an offer uh, uh, or, or, or hit the price that you want confidently um, and move to completion very, very quickly. The reason why that's important at the moment, um, I have uh, just this week uh, three uh, instances or three properties uh, uh, where we are now negotiating with multiple clients uh, on the same property. Um, and I think it's very much uh, in a case that uh, uh, owners do want the best deal, uh, obviously. Um, but part of that is not just the price uh, that people are prepared to offer, but how quickly you can move, how quickly you can organize things. So that really is important that you come prepared. Yeah, fab. Thank, thanks, John. Um, I will start with our first question. This one is for Joanna. Um, is it correct that the golden visa may be abolished? Well, <laughs> no one knows exactly if it will be abolished or if it will be reshaped or redesigned by the government. Um, I think there are a lot of fake news around golden visa and how um, badly this has been impacting uh, you know the country and the the, the price increasing the price um, of properties uh, for a very simple reason last year as maybe some of or all of you know the golden visa framework was amended uh, with effect in January 2022 and the in a, in a real estate point of view so we are now focusing on real estate because the golden visa has several ways of in or illegible investments not not necessarily a real estate investment uh, but from a real estate point of view and the implications for the Portuguese families basically the, the government narrowed the the properties that uh, can be used for uh, to instruct a golden visa application and these this uh, um, restriction was to a point where in fact if, for example, some of you want to buy a property and use that purchase to uh, instruct a golden visa application, that property cannot be located in the in the coastal area of Portugal, or for it to be in that in such an area, it has to be in a very specific location, like a resort, or a, a, you know, it has to be a property that it's not um, licensed uh, for habitation purposes. So it's not a property where a family would normally live. Uh, a, a Portuguese family, it's you'll find very, very few or even no fam no Portuguese families living in, in resorts with uh, all the common facilities, golf courses, swimming pools. Those are for, you know, um, remote workers, digital nomads, uh, uh, pre-retired uh, people. So it's difficult really to blame the golden visa for all this situation I, I i believe so if the government decides to go ahead with the, the abolishment i think it's more for political and marketing reasons due to the the the, the public pressure on the the habitation um matters and the desperate of many many families than uh, for a real uh, impact but uh, as soon as we have um, you know credible information on this we will write about it and we will let us know let let all everybody know through our website and 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 um um facebook and and linkedin yeah fab thanks joanna then um, our next question is for john um nina's asking um she's heard that some properties are sold with sitting tenants what does this mean um 
can you also use the property slash share it with the tenant? Um, occasionally, uh, we find instance of this, but it is the exception rather, rather than the rule. Um, tenancy law in Portugal does protect the tenant quite a lot, and that's probably a, a better uh, question to, to hand over uh, to Joanna. Um, but I would say don't worry about it too much unless you've actually found a property that has a sitting tenant. Um, but uh, uh, the majority of properties that we, we hand over are vacant. Uh, uh, I would say it's less than 5%, uh, uh, probably even less than 3% where you have uh, a sitting tenant. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, it's not something we deal with on a daily basis. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Maybe I'll add just a, a slight note to what John just said, Rosie. Um, especially in the Algar, where John and Devine's um, offices are located, what one will find more often are properties with license, you know, with the ability to be rented on a short-term basis, what we call the um, uh, local lodging or alojamento local in Portuguese, which is the typical Airbnb or um, you know homeway uh, uh, portals, and the in these cases uh, it is possible to buy the property and to have these licenses assigned to the new owners so they can, if they wish, to continue that activity. But that doesn't mean, and of course, if there are some future bookings. It is very common that, you know, during negotiation, parties also agree to take over the bookings or, you know, if, if this, this can be cancelled, any any reservations, any deposits paid have to be reimbursed or not. That will be part of the deal uh, in such cases, but uh, um, it, it doesn't mean that the property uh, cannot be used by the, the, the owners. And I would say, I don't know, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but this would be the majority of the cases in 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 the Algarve or in the, with the properties you you held you have yeah you are new john sorry we can't hear you <laughs> normally sorry i must get used to it but normally when we're marketing a, a property for sale that does have tenants uh, within it um through the negotiation process we negotiate their uh, exit of the property yeah. for the ownership uh, uh, change hands. Um, the only exception to that might be where you've had someone living there for 10 or 15 years that, that doesn't want to leave. And to be honest with you, we wouldn't take on a property in that sort of situation uh, to market it to, to UK buyers. Uh, uh, we, we want people to uh, uh, use their properties, enjoy their properties, uh, uh, not bring them problems. So, uh, yeah, you won't find properties like that listed with divine homes. In those cases, there will be preemption rights to the tenants. Okay, so bear in mind you have a good solicitor. Yeah. <laughs> um, John, <clears throat> sorry, um, someone's asking um, where are your offices? Um, in the do you have them in the Algarve? Um, as someone's visiting Lisbon and Algarve relatively soon. Well, we can't help you in Lisbon uh, so much, um, but we can help you. Uh, in the Algarve, and we also have an office in the Alentejo. Uh, so we have three offices uh, in the Algarve. I work in the, the central office, which is based in Albufera. Um, we have two offices over further to the east uh, in Sao Brasta Hotel and Moncalapacho, which is a, a small town just north of Tavira. Um, we do, however, cover the whole of the Algarve uh, from those three offices. So from Lagos to the Spanish border, uh, we can help you find a home. Uh, and if we don't have the property on our books, we also work in collaboration with all other agencies. So uh, if we don't have the property on our portfolio, we will find you the property. We offer a property finding service as well. Oh, thank you. Sorry if you could hear me typing, I didn't realize I was still on mute. <laughs> um, our next question is for Jack. Um, if I want to buy a property in Portugal and will transfer money to my Portuguese account from a UAE account um, where I receive passive income for my flat in the UAE, will I have to pay taxes to the Portugal government to transfer money to my account here? Um, he's here on a D7 visa. That's a great question and probably not one that I'm best suited to answer in terms of paying taxes from the, the Portuguese government. 
Uh, it might be something that Joanna might be able yeah. to help you with there. We can do those transfers. We're not just limited to UK buyers buying property in Portugal, so doing uh, great British pounds to euros. We can do um, dirhams um, or dollars from the UAE um, into Portugal. So we are able to assist with the transfers. In terms of your tax implications, um, that question, I would probably pass it on to Joanna. Sorry, Rosie, can you please repeat the, de the detail? I didn't understand where the monies were, if they were coming from. Yeah, uh, um, I believe it's coming okay. from, he wants to transfer money f to his Portuguese account from an account in the United Arab Emirates. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And he's asking, will he have to pay taxes to the Portuguese government? To be is that, the, the, the question is whether uh, that money is, uh, represents an income that is taxable in Portugal or not, okay? Just the fact that one has savings in a bank account and transfer those savings to Portugal, to the UK, to the US, wherever in the world, the Portuguese government will not tax the transfer itself. So what we need to bear in mind is from the moment you, you reside and live in Portugal under D7, under a digital nomad visa, in some cases, even under a golden visa, it will depend, there are separate matters, the Portuguese government will have tax power of your income worldwide. Okay, this is the main rule. Then there are several uh, bilateral agreements between Portugal and many, many countries, which are called double taxation agreements. And they are meant to avoid exactly, you know, precisely the double taxation of foreign income. So although you are a Portuguese resident, if you, that income you were referring to that is in your Portuguese bank account, came from the Emirates, for example, um, that income might be subject to tax in Portugal or not. It, it may end up uh, being uh, um, uh, only taxed in the, in the Emirates, but where, where I believe the tax is, is uh, very low or, or nil, um, and eventually not taxed at all in Portugal under the applicable double taxation scheme. So, in summary, Income doesn't mean um, a, a bank account uh, balance or, or, or transfer. You, you won't be paying tax on your savings. Portugal, from the moment you become a Portuguese resident, has tax power to, to, to tax a, a resident's income worldwide. And in principle, that income will be uh, um, assessed. The, the taxation of that income will fall under a double taxation agreement if it's a foreign income. And these agreements are meant to avoid double taxation. Otherwise, we will only pay taxes and there will be nothing left. <laughs> Fab, thanks, Joanna. Um, Jack, if I can come back to you. Um, Scott is asking, um, the pound is quite weak at the moment um, with inflation. Um, what are your thoughts? Should we wait until a better rate? Good question. This is probably one of the more popular questions that, <laughs> that we get asked. Shall we wait for a better exchange rate? Um, I wish I had a, a crystal ball, but we just cannot tell what's going to happen to the pounds. There's lots of indicators out there, like you mentioned, inflation, interest rates, um, economic and political factors, which could influence exchange rates. Um, but it is a guessing game. And, and that's why you come to us. You're buying a property in Portugal because you fall in love with Portugal. You fall in love with the property there um, and you've negotiated the price in, in euros. And our job is to then help you protect you from negative currency fluctuations. Uh, you don't want to get three months down the line where you're about to hand over the keys and you're paying an extra £20,000 on the on the euro uh, for the budget that you've put in place. You want to know from as early as possible how many pounds that property is going to cost you so that you can then put in place budgets and make sure that you've got peace of mind um, whilst managing all the other factors with yeah, legal and, and counterparty and everything else that you're going to have to sort out. Um, throughout the, the weeks and months building up to your completion. So um, answer to the, the question is, I don't know what's going to happen to the pound. Um, it is lower than it used to be. However, looking back over the last um, six years, um, this is actually about the average exchange rate that it's been. So it has been quite a bit lower and it has been higher. And my prediction would be that in the next 12 months, it's going to be lower and it's going to be higher again. It's just one of those things that unfortunately nobody can control. Fab, thanks. Thanks, Jack. And what are the main um, transfer options for someone looking to make a large purchase, say, a property? Yeah, good question. So we've got um, a couple of different ways in which we can manage it. So there's a very straightforward spot transfer. 
um it's yes yeah, sort of said on, on, on in my name a spot transfers on on spot so you will agree a contract with us to buy a particular amount of euros um you'll pay the pounds within two working days and we'll then deliver the euros for you um under your instruction where and when you want those euros to arrive so very straightforward there's a conversion in the middle um, and then you pay the pounds promptly over to ourselves um, the more popular option for, for property buyers, um, as I said, we're in the property industry, this is, this is our space, um, and therefore the most popular option that we have is called a forward contract. So a forward contract is there to uh, mitigate your, your risk. So if you look across uh, a typical buying journey uh, in Portugal, say three months, um, from day one that you've got an offer accepted on a property, you are locked in and buying that amount of euros. So call it 250,000 euros. Um, over the next three months, there's going to be ups, yeah, swings and, and highs and lows of a pound, but you can negate that risk uh, by locking into a, an exchange rate. So a forward contract locks you into an exchange rate for the duration of your completion. So we will then work with you to uh, understand how many euros you need to buy, uh, the duration of time it's going to take for you to complete, and what fixed rate we can achieve for you at that moment. Now, when you fix the exchange rate in, you pay a deposit to smart currency to, to fix a rate in. It's a holding deposit with us. And then the, the remaining balance of your pounds would then be due just before you complete on the property. So if I'm using 250,000 euros as an example, um, and say it's costing 200,000 pounds to keep the numbers straightforward, um, we would buy 250,000 euros. You would normally pay 10% of the pounds to us on the day that you agree the contract, so 20,000 pounds. And then you'd pay the remaining 90%, the remaining £180,000 at normally a couple of days before your completion. And we will then transfer the euros over to Portugal for you. So that way you've got peace of mind. You know exactly what the property is going to be costing you. Um, and if anything happens outside of your control with politics, e economy, anything like that, it's not going to influence at how many pounds the property is going to end up costing you uh, for your completion. Um, if you are, so that's for, for risk adverse clients, for people that don't want to take a chance on the currency, don't want to um, become obsessed by exchange rates. And um, if you are someone that likes to be a bit more risky uh, with these with these matters, there are other options that we can look to target particular exchange rates with you. Uh, but it does come with with an element of risk. So the best thing that you can do is um, register and, and have a, your personal trader and actually walk you through the different strategies um, and then work out which one is going to be best suited to your particular needs. So each client is different to that to that respect. Can, can I add something to that as well, Roseanne? Yes, can. Just, just going back to, to the original question, if people are worried uh, about exchange rates and think that they might go up in the sort of middle term, uh, um, then you can also uh, hedge the pound. Uh, uh, you can get finance in Portugal. Um, generally, uh, an, an expatriate will get about 70% of the value of a property here uh, uh, from a bank uh, uh, in the form of a mortgage. Um, when the pound recovers, uh, you can then uh, cancel your mortgage, transfer your funds with Jack, and uh, uh, you haven't uh, uh, lost anything on, on the transfer. Um, the other thing to bear into mind with consideration is that property prices here are rising very, very quickly. Last year, it was 19% uh, approximately, which is the highest uh, price increase in Portugal in 30 years. Um, so if you wait a year, the property uh, you might have wanted to buy has just become 20% more expensive, uh, but the pound only recovered 5% or 10% of its value. So uh, uh, or what you made up in the transfer, you actually lost in the, in the value of the property. So there are other solutions uh, uh, to it to work around uh, 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 the, the low value of the pound at the moment. Um, but that's where a good estate agent uh, comes into play. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Um, I have a question for you. Um, someone is asking, where would you recommend to look for... Um, homes, villas, apartments, properties in Portugal that um, would fall under golden visa regulations. So at that price point. Is that to me? Yeah, open. <laughs> um, well, as, as Joanna said, last year, it became much more difficult uh, for golden visa options. You could pretty much rule out 
the majority of the coast uh, and the metropolitan areas uh, uh, in Portugal. However, um, uh, also, as Joanna mentioned, there are some properties that you can still buy in the Algarve that, that do fall under the golden visa uh, scheme. Uh, firstly, if you want to be close to the coast, close to the beach, you have to look for properties that are within resorts and have touristic licenses. Uh, um, they are classified as commercial properties, so uh, they do not uh, uh, fall under the, the restrictions of buying in the coast, uh, but they do have to have a value uh, equivalent or greater than 500,000 euros. Um, there are some low density areas still in the north of the Algarve, but that's going quite away inland, sort of 30, 40 kilometers uh, uh, at least away from the coast uh, into very rural uh, areas. So if you like to live on your own and live in a small village, then maybe uh, uh, it's okay for you. Uh, and there you can uh, look at uh, uh, Golden Visa investments as well. There are a number of parishes uh, uh, that fall under this category. Uh, and there you can uh, look at a, a 400,000 euro investment will generally uh, get you onto the Golden Visa scheme. However, um, I would like to say that for most people buying in the UK, the D7 visa is really the preferable option. Um, for me, um, from what I've seen from my experience, the only real benefit most people get from the Golden Visa is the amount of time it requires you to stay in Portugal. Under the Golden Visa rules, I think it's limited to about 10 days. You only have to be here for about 10 days in a year. Uh, when with the, uh, the D7, I think it's 180 days uh, uh, within the year. So you really do have to be here with the D7. But other than that, the, the requirements of the D7 are very, very easy. The capital requirement uh, is about €1,200 Euros a month per person uh, um, uh, under the D7. So for, the Golden Visa gets a lot of news, a lot of publicity. Uh, and sometimes people forget about the D7. But, but actually, for, for most people, it can be the most preferable option. And let me add something to what Sean just said. Most people actually don't even need a visa, a, a, a residence permit, because, um, and that's why that initial conversation is so important. And this need may change within the years. Of course, you may have bought your property here like in 10 years ago, and then you decide to relocate to Portugal. So at the beginning, you didn't need a residence permit here. But then your life goes on and you decide to move to Portugal. But in fact, uh, uh, and for UK audience that is watching us, you have a 90 day uh, um, perm you know, visa exemption to enter and travel to Portugal. So, and you can use this twice a year. Of course, you have to, to follow the, the, the 180 day rule, which is not easy to explain to everyone, but it's something to, to clarify in, in that uh, initial meeting. But in most of the cases, our clients just don't need, <laughs> you know, and the consequences of applying for a residence permit, for example, like D7, as Sean was saying, at, is that you, you may not know that you might be ending up being considered as tax resident in Portugal, which is something you, you were not planning and you didn't need to. So if you want to continue to have all your tax affairs in the UK, and just have a holiday home uh, uh, here, which you can rent, you can uh, generate income to also to cover the costs of a mortgage or a property itself. And you can travel freely without any visa uh, for tourism purposes, restrictions during three months. So I don't know how many of you can have three months holiday in a year, but I would love to. Uh, and you know, if it's just not to overcomplicate, I think Brexit, generated it and created such an anxiety on British people um, and it's not needed actually you can you can still traveling and Portugal welcomes you without any visa restrictions for three months twice a year so How, however I hear at the the end of this year unfortunately any British tourists wanting to come to Europe in general will have to get a ETM visa 
Um, it's just the entry and exit. Yeah, it's a terrorism thing. Uh, Not it's third difficult. countries. Uh, yeah. And uh, um, yeah, anyone traveling to Europe at all. Uh, from yeah, it's UK. quite tricky on that. It's I've been quick. Been... It's really quick. Yeah. Yeah. All right, go on, Jana. <laughs> no, it's not difficult, even that one. It's not difficult to get. It's yeah. simple to get. So the, the nightmare uh, and the consequences that one may not see when applying for a residence permit. Um, and even though many people just say, oh, but no one will check if I spend uh, seven months in Portugal or not. That may be the case nowadays, but who they knows? Do. They do. They do. And they do. I had one client uh, refu refused entry uh, to Portugal and uh, he got on a plane home the next day after spending a night in Faro Airport. So no, I was not <laughs> mentioning about the, the 90 day uh, uh, rule. I was mentioning about the, the tax residency ah, yeah, yeah. consequences of, of spending so much time in Portugal, even under the under 87, for example, without having officialized the tax residency in Portugal, because many people still under this scheme okay i have a d7 i travel freely but no one knows i still pay my taxes in the uk um and that may be the case the control might not be so uh, strict at the moment but there is um uh, even you know uh, um even more exchange of information between governments and tax authorities and everything is automatic you know when when we cross a border we, you know, governments know we are here. We, we, it's it's difficult to avoid unless we 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 are uh, completely uh, non-digital and we we travel by bus and, and car. Um, still, we will leave our 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 fingerprints and and that's why I prefer, um, of course, to provide um, we prefer to provide clear uh, advice and not to and to avoid risks you know things may be easier now but you may be notified in two or four, three or four years for um, failure of complying with tax duties during the past four years so if it's something that you don't need and or at least it's something you thought and you uh, you know the risk when you made your decision that is one thing but risking and applying for residence visas and moving to portugal without changing any tax uh, uh status uh and just you know praying who knows will notice i don't advise that at all thanks joanna um uh, another one for you um Teresa is wondering she is an irish native she's irish by descent she's got an irish passport um, is it easier for her to move slash retire to Spain or Portugal? Far much easier, Teresa. <laughs> Far much easier. And, um, you know, for for uh, bearers of, of EU uh, passports, um, the process is quite simple. Uh, in terms of bureaucracy, you just need to come and, and uh, register yourself before your local um, town hall where you set your your residency and and then of course to upgrade and, and update your tax status you also have access to the nhr which is a tax uh, status that was created to attract newly residents to portugal and has some benefits lasting for 10 years um so it is applicable both for third countries nationals you know people from uk us and abroad willing to move to portugal and eu nationals including ireland um but the, the res and the relocation process and the, the residency it's quite straightforward because there are no visa requirements there is freedom of establishment in in portugal lovely thanks joanna um a question for jack um why would you or if sorry I'm trying to get my question right um let me just have a quick another look um why would um someone use you smart currency over their bank yeah there's a, a few few key reasons why that'd be the case so unfortunately bank yes they still a lot of people naively still use them because they don't realize that we exist so events like this help promote our services and, and make people realize that there is an alternative um, there's three three things that I normally explain to clients about using smart currency over a bank. So 
One is the, the options that you get about managing your currency risk. So mentioned earlier, a forward contract helps protect you from currency swings. Um, a bank won't do that for you. Your only option with a bank is to go there a few days before your completion and make the transfer. And therefore, if a week before your completion um, rates drop, you, yeah, you've got no, you've got no way out. You've still got to go ahead and buy your euro. So you're very limited in the options there. And when you go and speak with a bank, more often or not, the person you're speaking to has probably never helped somebody buy a property before, or if they have, it's been on on a very few occasions. Um, Whereas with ourselves, we've helped 40,000 people. Um, I've been doing this for over six years. So our experience, our help, um, and our, our understanding of the, the hurdles that you're going to go through throughout your buying journey will help us put a strategy together to, to mitigate that. Um, we don't charge any fees for transfers. Um, your bank will normally charge you. It normally is a very small nominal amount, but a saving is a saving. Um, and the exchange rate difference as well. So typically, um, anywhere between 2 and 4% um, is what I indicate to clients is what we save you. So if you're moving £200,000 across, um, we're normally between 4000 and £8,000 uh, pounds cheaper to use than a bank because unfortunately, a bank's exchange rates um, are pretty terrible when it comes to uh, foreign exchange because that's not it's not their focus. That's not where they specialise. Um, and that's why we've come into the, the business, into, the, into the, yeah, the sector about 20 years ago is to give clients a best alternative to the bank. Thanks, Jack. Um, our next question, I'll just open up. Um, when a property is purchased for the sole purpose of renting out, are there options for any guaranteed rent scheme in Portugal? Basically getting rent paid from the real estate agent, irrespective of, of the property being occupied or vacant? Um, there are some resorts that offer guaranteed rental schemes uh, um, that, that are still around. Uh, majority not uh, however uh, rental revenues are very good uh, we have a booming uh, tourism industry um, and if you don't want to be involved in that process or manage that process uh, there are many many companies that are happy to do that for you uh, for a commission um, and you can still see very good returns you know uh, we, we probably average around eight to ten percent uh, for most people when they're working in a uh, a situation where they have zero involvement in uh, in the, the the rental of their property. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would say, uh, John, um, uh, and to the audience. Unfortunately, after COVID, the fixed guaranteed rental incomes are very very rare. In fact, um, during COVID, many uh, resorts actually suspended unilaterally those um, rented schemes and generated a bit of pre-litigation, litigation cases. Um, it is rare. And in my opinion, in some cases, you know, there are no free lunches. <laughs> so for you to have a guaranteed income, probably that income will be lower than under a normal um, scheme, where, as John was saying, both parties will share the also, also both will share the benefits. Mm -hmm. um, uh, however, we have seen uh, in our practice some companies, there are many, many available schemes and, and contracts, uh, but there are companies, for example, um, who when they negotiate their rental uh, contracts with owners, they let you know in advance, for example, if you are renting your properties during the peak season of July and August, how much is due to the owner per week if during those weeks the property is occupied, is rented. So you don't have a guaranteed income necessarily because it is only that income will be generated if the property is rented, but you have some somehow an idea of how much you can get if you know they manage to rent a property during this that, that period. So the, what happens then is the, the balance, you know, for, for the difference between what is paid to the owner and what the, the, the manager gets from the guests will be their profit. So there is no commission explicitly there, but um, it's a way of minimizing, you know, the uncertainty around how much you will get if you rent your property. Fab, thank you. Um, our next question is for you, Joanna. Um, Jay's asking if a family member transfers money as a gift from a foreign account to his Portuguese 
account to buy property in Portugal, does a Portuguese bank hold the money and ask the source of funds from a family member? Or can one use the funds immediately to purchase property? That depends on the amounts. Uh, in, in the nowadays in duty money laundering, anti-money laundering uh, restrictions, uh, banks are required to um, ask what is the origin of the of the funds and the transfer, as well as uh, real estate agents and lawyers. Um, so we are all uh, kind of big brothers <laughs> asking our clients where the funds are coming from. Um, the, the, the fact that you are receiving that transfer or those funds are coming to a Portuguese account, you may have to justify to the, the bank why you're receiving that amount. For example, if you have any, any donation uh, deed or anything, uh, you saw the property or someone saw the property and get, offered you the, 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 the money, you may have to detail, especially if you have no documentation, uh, but then, uh, in principle, your bank will not froze your account, so that will be accepted unless any bell rings on anti-money laundering and terrorism um, prevention. Yes. Okay. On a different on a different note is whether that donation might be taxed in Portugal or not, uh, and that, as I just said, if one is tax resident in Portugal. There are tax exemptions for donations, certain donations, but not for all. So the fact that you receive those funds in a bank account in Portugal, there is a change of information between banks and the tax authority, and that might generate a tax contingency later on. Okay. Thanks, Joanna. <clears throat> I think our next question is probably best directed towards John. Um, do many people buy to renovate in Portugal? And is it easy in terms of um, actually renovating it, like finding trades, cost of labour, materials, that kind of thing? Um, I think the the evolution has changed a, a, a lot over the years. We see this all going up and down. Um, at the moment, uh, we, we have a shortage of supply of property. So even for people who want a property that is key ready, um for the right property they will actually look at renovating a property that's in the right location or has the specific size that they want because they just simply can't find a property that is key ready so renovation yet yeah, is a bigger part of what we do uh, today than back in sort of 2012 for uh, uh, urban regeneration is a big part of what's going on in Portugal around Lisbon and around the cities in Faro and Portimao and places like that so um, yes uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, work being done uh, simplicity of doing it well it depends how skilled you are yourself uh, there's a wide variety of materials uh, however we are still suffering some uh, logistical issues uh, from COVID. Uh, uh, one of my staff is renovating a property himself at the moment and he ordered a bath which he has waited six months uh, to be delivered. So that's a, a COVID uh, uh, issue um, but most materials are readily available in your sort of DIY stores uh, uh, if you're doing it yourself. Um, if you're getting somebody else to do it, um, you have to pick the right builder. Um, and uh, because there is so much renovation work going on at the moment, um, the, the right builder may have a, a backlog. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, quite often we can turn to, to builders and say, right, we need a job done uh, and it will be uh, six months uh, uh, down the road uh, uh, before you can get it. The good people are very, very busy so uh, um, easy it can be uh, but uh, finding the right people again is where having the right uh, advisor comes into play yeah fab thank you um our next question <clears throat> is for smart jack um so joseph is asking about the currency transaction so if you were um buying property using smart services is it a one-off currency transaction? How do we give the money to Smart? Do we move from our UK bank account? Would it be an online transfer? So a bit of the technical side yeah. of it. That's fine, yeah. So most UK banks will have uh, a limit on what you can move per day. So they limit your account to 
um, a particular amount. It can be um, as much as 50,000. It can be as low as 5,000 in some banks. Um, so yes, you can do your transfers online to ourselves. Um, it could be quite painful trying to move us, you know, six figure sums with 5,000 pound daily limits. It could take you a little while. So with the larger transfers, most people will normally go into their branch um, and make the payment to us. Um, it's done via bank transfer. So when you agree a purchase of euros with ourselves, um, we will send you our account details um, and then you'll go into your bank and make the transfer to us. Um, important to note that with the account details that we send you, um, it's always with Barclays and you're paying a ring fence segregated account that, that Barclays look after. So you're not paying smarts um, directly. We can't use that money for anything else and um, other than for your euros. So it's completely ring fenced and segregated um, in case of an event of anything happening to us. Uh, but like I said at the beginning of this call, we've been around for uh, 20 years under the same ownership um, and we've got some of the, the best uh, relationships and partnerships in, in the uh, in the property uh, side of things. So uh, you were very well versed at helping with large value transactions. And then the same thing happens going out to Portugal. So we'll make a, a bank transfer for you and um, over to Portugal. Um, and we can pay your solicitor, your agent directly, your developer, your builder, um, or we can pay it directly into your Portuguese bank account. So whichever is going to be easiest for you. And um, before we make that transfer, it's normally best to speak with your solicitor uh, just to make sure they're happy with where the money is going to arrive from an anti-money laundering point of view. Um, and then we'll make the transfer for you and it arrive the next working day from the day that you've given us the instruction. Lovely. Thanks, Jack. Um, our next question um, is RE, the D7 visa. Um, and somebody's asking whether um, either any of your companies um, assist in the process of them applying through for a D7 visa. Yes, of course. That is part of the relocation process and um, the, the immigration um, law applicable. So we, we do assist from the very beginning in many cases and usually the, goal, the D7 um, uh, application is, is filed uh, before the, the Portuguese embassy in the country of origin, in this case in the, in the UK. Um, so we will prepare everything, we will set up an appointment and you will have to go there in person on that date with the documents organized previously. We will remain in, in contact and then once your visa is, um, is granted, you will have uh, four months to come to Portugal and to apply for your residence permit. So the first stage is to get the visa, the D7 visa, and the second stage uh, already in Portugal to apply for the residence permit. And then we'll also assist you with preparing and, and accompanying you to the, the Portuguese CEF appointment, which is CEF is the Portuguese Foreigners and Borders Office. Uh, the entity uh, responsible for, you know, to, to for issuing residence permits uh, in Portugal. So definitely, yes. Lovely, thanks. Um, I will just say um, all of the contact details for our experts will be shared um, after the webinar. So um, don't worry about missing out. Um, our next question is for John. Um, can you negotiate on asking price? And if so, what's the average percent? Oh, um, yes, you can negotiate on asking price, um, but every case is individual. Um, I don't think uh, I would like to put a percentage as an average percentage uh, at the moment. Uh, the market uh, uh, changes so quickly. Every owner is unique. Um, and uh, um, I would say we're doing more deals at the moment that involve very little negotiation rather than you couldn't really see double digit uh, uh, figures in percentages uh, uh, generally a small discount to shake hands uh, uh, would be agreed uh, i think i said earlier on in this call at the moment we're working on three deals at the moment uh, or three properties at the moment where we have multiple uh, uh, bidders um, uh, so in all of those cases we are now above the asking price so uh, uh, there aren't any great deals to be had uh, with knocking owners down on price. They had too many buyers uh, stood at their door. Thanks, John. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, Joanna, Jay is asking, is it possible to get a mortgage for a person doing a remote job in Portugal? 
where their salary is getting transferred to, to a Portuguese bank account by a non-EU company? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. The most important is that you have a salary. <laughs> and if paid to a Portuguese bank account, even better. Um, the, the, the percentages of uh, the mortgage that can be uh, granted, uh, by, borrowed by, by a bank, uh, may actually increase if you are actually a Portuguese resident already. So for non-residents, as John said, uh, the common practice is that banks will not finance above 70% of the purchase price agreed or the valuation of the assets. So for LTV purposes, they, uh, the banks will assess um, the value of the property because the mortgage will fall over the property and it will be the guarantee. So um, that might, uh, whichever the lower, okay? I just, just said, usually they prefer to, to be a bit more conservative. Um, in this case, as a Portuguese resident's amount can go up to 85, in some, some very rare cases, 90%. Um, but definitely with the Portuguese uh, a salary paid in Portugal, that is a guarantee that any bank would like. Oh, thank you. Um, and a question for all three experts. Um, what are the common pitfalls for people buying in Portugal compared to people buying in the UK? Um, I'll go to John first. Um, I think going back to what we said at the start of the conversation, all three of us, be prepared when you come here, um, get your ducks in order, um, you know, get Jack's advice on, you know, what your budget is going to be in euros, uh, um, get our advice on how many properties you can see in the time that you're here. Um, that often changes uh, daily uh, because the, the, the market is so dynamic at the moment. Um, and also be aware that, that when you move to contract, we generally do that quite quickly. Uh, a promissory contract, it's similar to the exchange of the contracts uh, in the UK. Um, we tend to do that um, within sort of two to three weeks uh, uh, of a deal being agreed, a price being agreed. Whereas I think in the UK, it's a slightly longer and lengthier process. So have your money available. Um, you will generally need a 10% deposit for, uh, for that contract. Uh, have your lawyer available, um, you know, get a POA uh, done with Joanna as soon as you can. Uh, and, uh, and then you're ready to go. Um, yeah, buying property in Portugal, not in the UK at the moment. I think our prices are going up and, and your prices are going down by the sounds of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, I'll add three, um, three notes. Um, so, in Portugal, a technical survey, it's not mandatory, uh, different than in the UK. So, it's very common uh, that buyers think they will have a survey done, if they don't, even if they don't ask. Um, but that is not the case. So, if you are uh, willing to carry out a survey, you should um, tell your solicitor or your state agent. Usually they will mention about this option and be ready to, to pay for it. Um, there are plenty of uh, surveyors, qualified surveyors, uh, who will then prepare a report. It's better for it to be in English, but uh, sometimes, especially out of the Algarve, it's difficult to find good surveyors reporting in English, I must be honest. Um, and don't count that uh, your vendor, so the counterparty, will fix everything you find or your surveyor will find in the property that you would like to have. So that you will pay a second-handed property, but you will get it new or uh, all fixed. So uh, the survey report may be used, it's mainly used for you to actually know what you are buying and if there is any work required, where do you, you, you may start for and how much, you know, get a quotation from builders, uh, prioritize what is urgent and what it's not. Um, in some cases, there is some space, some room for negotiation, but as John said, uh, even, you know, nowadays, what we experience is, is take it or, or leave it. Uh, vendors don't want to waste money and time in a property that they are selling. And uh, bear in mind that there will be another potential buyer willing to pay and to do the work. So uh, John was saying that not only the price is, um, you know, a, a key uh, um, 
matter to decide on and to have an offer approved sometimes is if a buyer is asking too much uh, it may up uh, losing the, the the property this for the survey Secondly, um, in Portugal, uh, well, unfortunately, Portuguese people do not use uh, solicitors on a preventive way very much. They prefer to do <laughs> themselves and then to, uh, if there are problems later on, they will have to deal with them and uh, spend what I say, good money for bad money, which is going to court sometimes. So, um, it's, I, I don't want to, to repeat myself nor to uh, oversell, but it's really mm -hmm. important to have a solicitor to help you prevent problems. It's really our focus uh, to prevent as much as possible. And even if we do an amazing job, sometimes it's not possible to prevent everything. But especially in a, for, a, a different country, can you imagine the struggle of having litigation in Portuguese here? Um, or, or uh, ending up losing your deposit without being well informed. So mm -hmm. it's important to be advised. And uh, third, uh, and to terminate, John was mentioning that you should be ready to pay 10% deposit. You should have your funds uh, through, you know, discussed with Jack. So you are, uh, you know exactly how much you can transfer and do that very quickly. And bear in mind, mm -hmm. That's different than in the UK, this deposit in Portugal is usually non refundable. So, if for any reason you decide to pull out or you fail to meet the, you know, the timelines, uh, of course, it's not immediate in some cases, maybe, but you may create an issue if later on you, don't ha you are not ready to complete. Uh, and uh, from our experience, for example, we have many clients selling in the UK before buying in Portugal. And many things can happen with the UK sale. Uh, so if you don't have a plan B, like you don't have a mortgage in Portugal ready to move in, you may end up losing your deposit and your property. Mm -hmm. So this deposit, whether it's five, 10, 15, 20%, sometimes it's it's larger, especially in, in um, most attractive developments where deposits can increase uh, significantly we are talking about an effective risk of losing this money. So bear it in mind, uh, have your promissory contracts as bulletproof as possible for your concrete circumstances and mm -hmm. make sure that you release all the information to those who are advising you. For example, if you are selling a property, please tell your solicitor that you are selling a property. Don't just do it later on down the line. Um, and uh, they will help you having a plan A and a plan B uh, for you to make sure you don't um, you don't do the right the wrong move. Thank you, Joanna, and thanks. Sorry, go on, Jack. I was going to say just to wrap it up. So it seems like a key theme from this whole um, webinar. Say is planning, um, and again, from common pitfall in the currency exchanges lack of planning so um it's making sure that you've got a plan in place before you go on a viewing trip so you've spoken to myself or one of the traders you know what strategy it is that you think you want to, to, to happen when you have an offer accepted um as john's mentioned demand is very very high supply is, is very low for properties in portugal so the chances are if you find a property you like um, without sort of creating urgency you will probably be making an offer quite quickly on that property if that's the one you want um, and then the most important thing after that is that you've got your contacts in place, you've got your um, options in place so that you can then act quickly and you can act confidently so you know you're not going to walk into any circumstance or situation that you're exposed to anything negatively. So uh, planning is, is definitely the, uh, the key word from today's webinar, I think. Yes, definitely. Absolutely. Don't, don't do anything in Portugal that you wouldn't do back in the UK. Sometimes... Uh, uh, when people get off a plane, uh, the sun is shining, the <laughs> few sangrias, uh, and they're with a, a non-reputable agent like uh, like Divine Home. Uh, the agent would say, oh, yeah, don't use a lawyer, don't do a survey, yeah. don't do this, don't do that. Um, don't listen to those sorts of people. Uh, uh, don't do anything that you wouldn't do at home and make sure that you've got a good lawyer like Joanna involved in the process from the get-go. Fab. Thank you, everyone. Um, I will thank you on behalf of all our listeners for your insightful tips and advice. We strongly recommend that you get in touch with Matt Law, Divine Homes and Smart Currency individually to discuss your requirements in detail. 
Um, before we finish up, I would like to invite you all to register for our virtual event, which is coming up on the Saturday, the 25th of March. It's a day when you can gather all the information you need, make key contacts to help guide you on your journey to property hunting in Portugal. Smart and Smart Currency and Matt Law are already signed up, so they will be there too. Um, I'll share the link right now if you would like to register and get your e-ticket. Two seconds, just bear with me. I'll just grab that for you now. I think I'm having a bit of a technical difficulty. It's the 25th of March, right, Rosie? Yes, yeah, yeah. Saturday, the 25th of March. It's completely free. Um, it's all online. Um, there we go. Storm shared the link for me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you can join us online. Um, so thanks to all our viewers for watching this session. We wish you all the best for your move overseas. Um, we have various other resources available to help with your buying journey, including guides, webinar recordings. Um, so yeah, just take a look at our website. This webinar will be recorded. It's already been recorded. So um, you can watch this from tomorrow. Um, so yeah, thanks again. Pro happy property hunting. And thank you to our experts. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for all your questions. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, have Rosie. a good evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.